Fannie Willis wants these defendants to turn against each other and more specifically to turn against Trump, to turn state witness. It seems that John Eastman is doing the opposite of that. He's pledging his attorney skills, his constitutional knowledge to defend his co-defendants. The other thing Fannie Willis wants is she wants to coerce each of these people to recant their claims that the 2020 election was stolen. And Eastman had a response to that as well. Let's take a look. Still think the election was stolen? Absolutely. Absolutely. Still. No question. No question in my mind. And you won't answer on immunity from prosecution. You won't answer that. Do you think that the others in this case Absolutely, have a standing he on says. that? People like Meadows? Okay, that's good. Let's get on this. Uh, no comment. Absolutely, he says, the 2020 election was stolen. You gotta love that because Fannie Willis's prosecution hinges on these two assumptions that these witnesses, or these, not the witnesses, that these defendants will turn on each other and turn on Trump and that they'll recant their claims. And they are already proving that they will not do that. So President Trump is going to have a mugshot just like just like Giuliani, just like Sidney Powell, just like Jenna Ellis. Um, the sheriff of Fulton County said that they're gonna treat him just like a common criminal. In fact, this is what he can expect. This is from the Epic Times. I'm gonna bring this up. It says the Fulton County Sheriff claimed that Donald Trump will be treated like local inmates during the booking process with no special accommodations accorded, uh, accorded to the former US president. If you're indicted, this is Sheriff Patrick Labatt, then we're going to treat you as though you're indicted here locally. And so we'll consider you to do fingerprints, mugshots, et cetera. Charles Rambo, a retired Lieutenant of the Sheriff's office said that the media out or said to the media outlet that once inside, quote, they would be pat down, led to the booking office in the rear. From there, they would probably have ties and shoestrings and all those things taken. Then from there, the persons would be fingerprinted, even given a booking photo. Does this seem ironic to you that in the most highly secure, one of the highest security prisons in the United States, uh, Jeffrey Epstein was somehow able to kill himself because he had a bed sheet handy and no cameras trained on him. And yet, ostensibly for security purposes, they're gonna take President Trump's shoelaces away. Like something is wrong. Houston, we have a problem. This is backwards. This is evil. This is immoral. But hopefully President Trump is at least able to fundraise or something off of that mugshot. Hope he makes it his profile picture across the board. Um, the point is they want people to become violent. They want conservatives to commit acts of violence because we feel so much passion. We feel frustrated. We feel hopeless. We feel anger. They want us to commit violence, but of course, nobody is going to do that because as soon as even one crazy person does that, well, then we've fallen into the trap that the left has laid for us and they will crack down on everybody's speech because remember the crux of this case, the crux of this indictment is that speech is not free speech, that speech is violence. And because speech is being redefined as violence in the court system and by the left, therefore it can you can be indicted for speech that the left doesn't want. So if any nut commits violence because they are angry that the government is being weaponized against President Trump, then the left will point to that violence and say, see, proved our point. The speech caused violence. President Trump's speech incited whatever act of violence would happen. So conservatives, of course, are not going to be stupid enough to fall for that. Meanwhile, in the state of Maine, this is one of the most horrendous stories that I have read in a long time. It's hard to believe that this is real, but this is the thing of Ibram Kendi's dreams. This is the thing, this is critical race theory, not just in children's schools, but applied against white people in the medical system. This is from Fox News. A Maine hospital executive involved in diversity, equity, and inclusion hosted an anti-racist prayer service that had a group of white people apologize for their internalized racism as white people. This according to a video reviewed by Fox News Digital. Ryan Polly is a vice president of DEI at Maine Health, a hospital system of over 20,000 employees. He said that the hospitals cater to overwhelmingly white patients, which is reflected by local demographics. Polly refers to himself as a minister of a group called One Spirit. In a video that was re reviewed by Fox, Polly's shown teaching attendees how to be practitioners of anti-racism through a prayer that he dedicated to loving spirits who are known by many names. He said during the prayer services that he himself maintains racist narratives and biases and attributed those to his skin color. As you might expect, look at that picture. What are all of these, what are all of these uh, anti-racist educators, anti-racist educators, I put that in quotation marks, they're white. They're oftentimes white. Robin D'Angelo, the author of White Fragility, 
the book that you could argue brought critical race theory to the forefront of corporate awareness, of course she's white. She travels around the country making money off of speeches, telling white people that they're bad, and she's a white woman. This is what this, this DEI executive said, as the head of diversity, equity, and inclusion at a major health system, I think frequently about my role as white person first and as diversity leader second. I think about the responsibility I have to continue the deep internal work of understanding my own racist narrative and biases. I think about the privilege my whiteness affords me and the choices whiteness allows me to have. My whiteness keeps me and my family safe. Now, if you're thinking this sounds really, really racist, you would be correct. If you're wondering how this applies in a healthcare system, well, that's a very pertinent question because if you're a white person walking into a hospital, you shouldn't be wondering, am I going to get subpar medical care because of the color of my skin? Am I going to face racial discrimination in a moment of emergency during a health crisis because of the level of melanin on my arms and legs and face? Like this is freaky, freaky stuff. Polly said white people acquire ignorance, biases, and racist thoughts on the basis of their belonging to a, quote, life of whiteness. This is, and of course, by the way, what do we always say that critical race theory is? We say critical race theory is a descendant, the grandchild of critical theory, which is a Marxist theory from the Frankfurt School. Critical race theory is Marxism. It's racialized Marxism. And there's always that tell. There's always that one phrase that critical race theorists or DEI operators always use that give themselves away. In this case, Ryan Pauly says that his, his uh, DEI prayer which seems sacrilegious even to say those two words in the same phrase. He said it's focused on, quote, dismantling the system. And there, ladies and gentlemen, we have it. That is the ultimate goal of Marxists. They want to dismantle our governmental, economic, and cultural systems. They want to destroy everything that we know and love and rely on and instead force communism and Marxism on us. And this absolute creep is doing it by discriminating against white people in the hospital, all in an effort to dismantle the system. There's always a dead giveaway, a dead giveaway. So Yegevny Prigozhin, the Russian head of the Wagner Group, you know, this private army that was fighting for Vladimir Putin in Ukraine, was fighting then got into a little tit for tat with Vladimir Putin because the Wagner group didn't get what the Wagner group wanted. Vladimir Putin didn't give them what they wanted. And so they began to march on Moscow ostensibly to challenge Vladimir Putin, maybe to occupy Moscow, maybe to overthrow Putin. This happened a month ago. We were all kind of wondering, well, what is going to happen? Hi guys, it's Liz Wheeler. Don't forget to watch my show, The Liz Wheeler Show, every night at 7 p.m. on The First TV. You can download the free First TV app or you can visit thefirsttv.com slash Liz and start watching today.